Ah. Well, thank you for having me. This is the first time I ever gave more than one talk in a row. And I'm uh, very pleased that so many people are still here. Um, so the area where the polynomial method has had the biggest influence is in incidence geometry. And so what I'm going to do today is explain what is incidence geometry and some, some sense of the field. And then I can try to explain what is the impact that the polynomial method has had. Um, OK, so incidence geometry is about we have a lot of lines or other simple geometric objects. And we want to understand how they can intersect each other. Um, so for example, if I draw some lines in the plane, um, I might be interested in some kind of special points, like these points that have three lines going through them. And I could keep drawing lines and try to make as many of those as possible. And there's a little bit of strategy, because maybe if I'm lucky, I can get two of them for the price of one. And if I plan way ahead, maybe I can get hundreds of them for the price of one. So let's state it a little more. Uh, so L will be a set of L lines in the plane. And S sub R of L, called the R rich points of L, is the set of x that are contained in at least R lines. So one of the most fundamental questions in incidence geometry is, um, given L and R, how many of these points can we make? Let's look at a few examples, and then I'll tell you the answer. Um, OK. One thing we can do, if I want to have some R rich points, is I put R, R lines through a point, and then I put R lines through another point, and so on. And I can get L over R clusters like this. Um, but sometimes uh, we can do better than that. Actually, so another rather, rather easy thing we can do is that if r is 2, we can just put the lines in general position. Then every pair of lines intersect, and all of the intersection points are different from each other. And so s2 of l will be l choose 2. That's actually much better than that. OK. And there's one more example, uh, which is a, a little bit it's elementary, but a little bit deeper and more delicate than these. Um, so, so we're going to have a lot of R-rich points. So locally, we're going to have a bunch of these things. And what we would like is that each line contributes not just to one point, but to a bunch of the points. And then we can hope to beat this thing. So here's a way of organizing that. Um, do a little, a little vocabulary. So the height of a rational number, p over q, is defined to be p plus the maximum of p and q, if p and q are in, in lowest terms. And um, a little lemma is that if you look at the number of rational numbers with the height at most some number a, um, this is approximately a squared. So I, I look at fractions p over q. p and q can both be at most a, so I have a squared choices. But I only get to keep the ones which are in lowest terms. So I have to throw some of them out. And you can check that there are still around a squared of them left. OK, so now we can build our example. Um, we take a square grid, take an n by n square grid. And then the set of lines is the set of lines with the height of the slope at most 10 root r and through the grid. So somewhere going through one of the points in the grid. And so the, the good thing about this is that I've, I've chosen enough heights so that the number of different slopes is r, so at least r. And then through every point, I will have a, r different lines at these different slopes through this point. And actually, you have to imagine a bigger grid for this to start to look like a good idea. Um, but this line hits that point. It's going to hit another point, and another point, and another point. And so each line is going to have a lot of points on it. And I'm going to beat this. So this is example three. And these three examples are the best examples that are known. 
and they're basically tight. And that's the content of the, of the uh, most fundamental theorem of incidence geometry. So, so this question was solved by Semerady and Trotter in the early 80s. Um, so the answer numerically is that the number of R-rich points is at most a constant L squared R to the minus 3 plus L R inverse. And, but, and what it says morally is that these examples are sharp. This is the best thing to do for large R. Best if R is at least L to the 1 half. Um, this is the best thing to do if R equals 2, although it's a special case of that. And this is the best in the other cases. And it takes a little computation. But the number of R rich points in this picture is L squared R to the minus 3. Um, this, is, this is the trickiest example. And it's an important fact in this field that, that we know very few examples. So uh, this, is, this is basically the only trick in town as far as producing an example with a lot of R rich points. You can do some trivial things, like you can replace a square grid with a rectangular grid. And you can perform transformations that take lines to lines, projective transformations. But this, is, this is about it, of what we know. OK. Um, so I want to give a flavor of the field of incidence geometry by explaining the main ideas of how to prove this central theorem. Um, so the first observation is the axiom of Euclidean geometry that says that two lines intersect in at most one point. And we can get some mileage out of that. It helps to estimate this thing. So it leads to a couple of estimates. Estimate number one, um, it implies that the number of R rich points is bounded by L choose 2 divided by R choose 2, which is approximately L squared over R squared. Um, so the, the reason for that is the following. There are L choose 2 pairs of lines. They each intersect at most once. And if I look at any r rich point, there will be r choose two of the pairs intersecting there. OK. Um, and it leads to another estimate that if r is big enough, if, if r is at least 2 out to the 1 half, um, then the number of r rich points is bounded by for L R inverse. And so this one is sharp. This has a slightly longer argument, but in the same spirit as this. Um, so I'm not going to do the details. But if you spent 20 or 30 minutes after the lecture, I think you would just figure it out. OK. So based on this fundamental axiom, we get some estimates about how big this thing can be. But it's not as good as the theorem. Um, so the, the gap, since the equations are a little complicated, let me do an example to illustrate the gap. The gap is biggest when r happens to be l to the 1 half. And then um, the basic estimates give that sr is bounded by around l. But the summary trotter theorem says that sr is bounded by around l to the 1 half. There's a pretty substantial gap. And at this point, it, the problem starts to become difficult. And you can take this and, and try double counting different things and, and play around. And you, it, one feels stuck. And there's an important example that explains why we get stuck here. And the example is um, lines in the finite fields. So we'll work in the finite field fq squared. And there's a wonderful finite set of lines in fq squared, which is all of them. Um, so L will be all. It's a bit easier to count if I say non-vertical. This is not important. Lines. So they're given by y equals mx plus b, where m and b have q choices. So the number of lines is q squared. And now each point of fq squared lies in q different lines. Therefore, I have sq of l is q squared. And since q squared is l, I can translate that to say that s l to the 1 half of l is l. Um, 
So for lines and points, for lines in finite fields, this example exactly matches what the basic estimates say. And in finite fields, it's still true that two points determine a line. So just using that axiom, no matter how cleverly, we can never improve this and never prove some ready trotter. So the philosophical issue in trying to prove some ready trotter is that we have to use some property of lines, which is true in R2 and false in FQ2. Um, and it's going to have to be subtler than two points determine a line. Um, so there are several beautiful proofs, and they all in some way use the topological features of R2, which are quite different from FQ2. I'm going to show you one of them, which is the most relevant for doing things later with the polynomial method. This is called the cutting method. Maybe it's good now to go back here. So the, the cutting method is a kind of divide and conquer argument. It's from a paper with many authors. Let me read it to you. So this is a big contribution. So, okay, it's um, Clarkson, Edelsbrunner, Guibus, Pollock, Seidel, Scherer, and Snoyink. So, um, okay. So what we're going to do is draw some auxiliary lines. We'll take D. We'll make D red lines in the picture. And that will cut our space into d squared um, cells, components. And so in this way, we'll divide up the, the r-rich points and the lines. And then we can count what's happening in each cell and add them up. Let me make a picture. So I'll introduce some auxiliary lines that cut the space into pieces. And we're going to count what's going on in each piece. Now, at this moment, we're using the topology of R2. Because in a finite field, of course, we could make some auxiliary lines. But the complement would not be divided into components. OK. Now, this divide and conquer argument, um, like probably most divide and conquer arguments, it works the best if we manage to divide things evenly. So um, let's write down what we could hope for in terms of dividing things evenly. So we have, we have d squared cells. And so we, we could hope, the best we could hope for is that about 1 over d squared of these points are in each cell. So I'm going to give that a name, a definition. We'll say the d red lines obey equidistribution 1 um, if there are at most, at most a 1 over d squared fraction of these r rich points in each cell. So that's what we could hope for with the points. It also makes sense to think about the lines. Um, there's a basic observation about the lines, which, which makes this which is crucial, um, which is that each line enters at most d plus 1 cells. Because it can only cross each red line once, so it can only cross the walls d times. So it can only be in d plus 1 cells. Um, so, uh, right. so that's a crucial thing about, about why this is useful, that each line is only in a small fraction of the d squared cells. Um, so on, on average, so equidistribution 2. Since there are d squared cells and each line is in d of them, an average cell will intersect L over d lines. And if they're evenly distributed, every cell will be like that. So equidistribution 2 says that each cell intersects at most L over d lines. OK. So this is what we could hope for in terms of cutting things up evenly. And then uh, imagining that we had this, we could just do a computation. We know we've cut things up evenly. We know how many points and how many lines are in each cell. We apply the basic estimate inside of each cell, and then we add. And what comes out of that computation is the bound in the sum ready trotter theorem. Let me state that as a proposition. So proposition, uh, I could be either 
1 or 2. And then we suppose that for any d between 1 and L, um, there exists a choice of d red lines. Um, and they are equidistributed in one of these senses. And then the number of R rich points is bounded by the sum already trotter bound. This is just a computation. One of the nice things you realize when you actually do the computation is that you don't need to distribute both the points and the lines. You could just distribute either one of them, and it's good enough. And as long as everything is evenly distributed, we get the right bound. So, um, so when I first did this computation, I thought I had figured out, I had understood the main idea of the proof of the Semmeretti Trotter theorem. You divide into pieces, you apply basic estimates in each piece, and you put together again. Um, so in order to really apply this theorem, we need to produce some lines that equidistribute something. Uh, that didn't seem like, that seemed like a minor issue to me. I guess I kind of thought that if I have some points and I sort of randomly or without thinking choose some lines, then there's no reason any cell would have a lot more points than any other cell. And so they would probably be about evenly distributed, and then we would be happy. Um, that intuition of mine was, is totally wrong. Um, let me give you another perspective that makes it sound like this is not very likely to work. We get to choose D red lines. So we have two D real parameters at our disposal. And we would like to have every cell obey, say, this condition. So this is one condition per cell, so th and there are d squared cells. So I'm hoping to have my 2d lines obey 2d conditions. Uh, so morally, this is not that different from having 2d variables and hoping to solve d squared equations. This is not something where we should feel like, you know, oh, that'll just take care of itself. That's no problem. So in fact, based on what I've said so far, uh, I think it would be reasonable to feel that this is a method that will probably not work. Um, let me, I can also give uh, an example. There's a set of points which we cannot equidistribute. So to do this, take a convex curve and put on it a bunch of points. And now suppose I try to make d red lines so that the points are evenly distributed among d squared components. Um, I run into a problem because every line can only hit my convex curve twice. And so this convex curve will only be cut into, at most, 2D components. So all of the points will only be in 2D components. In the whole plane, there will be D squared components. And almost all of them will have no points at all. OK. Um, so there's a serious issue that we s they still have to tackle before this will work. Um, and there's, there's one more major idea, second major idea of the cutting method that makes the Semmeretti Trotter theorem work. So there is a very important but simple idea, which is to choose the red lines, choose the red lines randomly from the set of lines. And if we, if we do this, then we get something close to equi-2. We don't quite get equi-2, but we get almost equi-2. Um, so the full proof of Samaretti Trotter, we first choose these random lines, and we get a cell decomposition. And then we, they added it a little bit by adding a few more lines here and there. Um, but, so, but not getting into the details, this is the major main idea, how to get some equidistribution. Um, and let me give some intuition about why this works. So I want to imagine choosing these D lines one at a time instead of all at once. And let's say choose D over two of them and then pause. Uh, OK. So we have, we've chosen some number of red lines. And there's a lot of other lines. And we look at one of the cells here. And we try to uh, guess what is likely to happen to this cell when we choose the other d over two lines. Um, so we can think about, so we'll look at the number of 
lines that intersect the cell. And depending on that, um, what will probably happen? OK, so one number I'd like to consider is 1 tenth of L over D. If there are 1 tenth of L over D, then the odds. Yeah, little d is big D. Thanks, Avi. So, <clears throat> um, so if there were L over D lines, then on average I would choose about one of them or half of them when I choose D over two more red lines. So if there's one tenth, then there, you know, there's a 95% chance I won't choose any of them. This cell will likely survive. OK, and another scenario is, what if there are 10 to the sixth L over D lines in the cell? Then um, on average, I will choose a million of them to color red, and this cell will get cut into tiny bits. Cell cut to bits. OK, so in this process of gradually adding lines, cells that have significantly more than L over D lines in them have a short half-life. They're very unstable, and they disappear. And so it's reasonable that if I, if I do this, there will be very few of them. Um, and that's the case. OK. So these are the main ideas in one proof of the Samaretti Trotter theorem. And they give a sense of some of the main players, some of the main ideas in the field of incidence geometry. So far, we've talked about only one question. Um, and so next, I wanted to explain some other questions and give a sense of what are some open problems in incidence geometry? What do people want to do from here? So is this how a Trotter and Samaretti did it? What, what you outlined here, or is this a different proof? This is a different proof. Yeah, so there are three wonderful proofs of the Samaretti Trotter theorem. This is the second one, which is by these seven authors, Clarkson and dot, 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 and Snow Yink, in around 1990. Um, and um, yeah, so there's a, there's a few different ones. Uh, OK, so let me mention some open problems, some problems, some, some solved now and some open in the field of incidence geometry. Uh, what would we like to do from here? Um, so there are many, many problems that we get by generalizing the samaretti trotter problem. Uh, one thing that we can do is we can replace lines with something else. Here we have uh, many different choices. But one, one choice, which is very interesting and not at all understood, is unit circles. So I suppose we have L unit circles. So that's our set C of unit circles. And then I can ask, how many R-rich points can there be with these circles? Uh, OK, so, so we know that it obeys the same bound as in the samaretti trotter theorem, with more or less the same proof. But unlike for lines, this appears to be probably much too big. So all of the examples are almost, all the examples are bounded by L to the epsilon, so something very minor, times L over R, which is something trivial that you get by just picking a point and put R circles through it and pick another point. OK. Um, you can imagine that if you replace this with various other things, it will usually also be not understood. Uh, let me quickly describe the, why this is such the source of the difficulty of this problem. Um, the difficulty is that it's hard to distinguish unit circles versus some other curves, such as unit parabolas. Uh, that's not a standard word, so, but a unit parabola is, means y equals 1 times x squared plus ax plus b. This is also a two-parameter family of curves. They're also quadratic curves. They have many properties in common with unit circles. And for unit parabolas, uh, unit parabolas also obey the samaretti trotter bound, and it's sharp. So to get some improvement for unit circles, we have to find some property of unit circles. This is true for unit circles, and it's false for unit parabolas, and it's false for straight lines. And um, there's no even good candidate for what this property would be, let alone how to leverage it to prove estimates. OK. Um, 
<clears throat> so this is a major open problem in the field of incidence geometry. Let me mention another direction we might want to go. Um, another, another direction we might want to go is to higher dimensions. So instead of talking about lines in the plane, we could talk about k-dimensional planes in, in place of lines, which are in Rn in, space of, in place of R2. OK. Um, here, there, <clears throat> here there are some things that we know. Um, <clears throat> Um, so one of, <clears throat> excuse me, it's challenging to give three talks in a row. <clears throat> one of the great things about the cutting method is that it was able to do some things in higher dimensions. So there are a couple of other proofs that I haven't told you about today, and they tend to be quite planar. Um, <clears throat> so one of them uses Euler characteristics in the plane um, and other things that are hard to generalize to higher dimensions. Um, so, and the cutting method had some success in higher dimensions. Let's think about modifying it to this situation. Mm. <clears throat> so, instead of uh, d red lines, we would have d red hyperplanes. <clears throat> and uh, that would cut space into d to the n cells. Now I cut space into d to the n cells. Um, and then we could ask whether we have equidistribution. We could easily write down what it would mean for things to be evenly distributed. And if we had equidistribution, we would get some interesting bounds out of it. Uh, and then we need to think whether we really can evenly distribute things. And um, so then if k equals n minus 1, um, then we can use the major idea. <clears throat> if our objects were themselves hyperplanes, we could choose randomly some of the hyperplanes to cut up space, and they would evenly distribute the other hyperplanes, and we could prove things. But there's a new problem that happens if k is less than n minus 1, and that's the, what I call the co-dimension barrier in the title. So if k is less than n minus 1, um, it's hard. Um, so until recently, there have been very few sharp estimates, good estimates, that hold when in the co-dimension is at least 1. And I'll introduce you to them in a minute. Um, one example of a problem, we've seen an example of a problem in co-dimension 1. That's the joints problem. That was a problem about lines in R3. And one of the features of it, it might have looked a little arbitrary in the first lecture, one of the features of it is that it's one of the simplest problems in incidence geometry in co-dimension at least one, and one of the first to have a sharp answer. OK. Um, so one of the big successes, I think, of the polynomial method is that it's led to several sharp problems and sharp theorems in co-dimension at least one that extend the summary trotter theorem from the plane. And I'm going to now explain to you what they are, uh, what we can prove, and we'll talk about how to prove it. Um, so I'm going to start with a slightly older theorem of Toth. Toth was interested in whether the Samaritan Trotter theorem is true also for complex lines. And he proved that it, it was. So if we have L complex lines in C2, um, then the same estimate holds. So this is around 0, 03 or 04. <coughs> so if you think about trying to do this with the cutting method, if you think about it geometrically, there's a problem because the complex lines are, from the real point of view, two dimensional planes in R4, and they don't cut the space into cells. So we can't do the thing that I showed you. Um, 
Toth proved this theorem by modifying, building on the original proof of Semiretti and Schroeder and in, a, in a somewhat difficult way. And while he was working on it, he started to wonder about how planes intersect. This is a special case of two planes intersecting in R4. He started to wonder about that. And he made a, a bold conjecture about how, how planes may intersect in higher dimensions. So his conjecture is the following. If I have L k planes in R to the 2k, um, and if um, any two, so if pi 1 intersect pi 2 has at most one point, we'll talk about that in a second, um, then they obey the Semiretti Trotter bound. The number of R rich points is bounded by L squared R to the minus 3 plus L R inverse. Um, let me explain why we need star. Uh, so a new feature of k planes is that two k planes can intersect in a line. And if I allow that, then uh, all kinds of very degenerate things can happen. So I just pick a line L, and then I pick all k planes that contain L. And then this entire line, which is infinitely many points, uh, are all rich for the full number of k planes. OK, so we have to rule this out somehow, and this is one nice way of doing it. It also connects with his original problem, because two complex lines will only intersect in a point. So this would be true. Um, so one of the, one of the good theorems with the proven now with the polynomial method is that this conjecture is very nearly true. Theorem of Soimosi and Tau. Um, so under these conditions, the number of intersections is bounded by, so a constant that depends on epsilon l to the epsilon, so something smallish times the conjecture. Um, I'll state one other theorem that comes up. Um, this is a slightly older theorem of, of Nets, Katz, and myself about lines in space. Um, so suppose we try to generalize Semiretti Trotter to lines in space. So first we might ask, so we have L equal to L lines in R3. We might ask, uh, you know, how big can the, how many R rich points can there be? Uh, but this does not turn out to be an interesting question. The problem is, so that the answer is exactly the same as in R2. <coughs> Um, so the reason is, on the one hand, R2 is contained in R3. So we have all of the same examples as before. And we just have to worry if there are new examples with even more points. But on the other hand, we can do a generic projection. R3 goes to R2. And so if we have some lines in R3, we can project them and we'll get a set of lines in R2 which can have only more intersection points. And so there, there aren't any new examples in R3. And so, so this is not that interesting a question. Um, you, we could say that it's not interesting because it doesn't turn out to be a really three-dimensional question. It's just the same as the previous two-dimensional question. Um, so it's interesting to come up with. Why do you say it's the same? You need information. It's not the same. So when I do a, when I do a projection, um, the reason I do it generically is I want to make sure that two different lines in space come down to two different lines in the plane. That'll happen for almost every projection. Yeah, but it's not automatically the same. You have to say something in order to make it the same. Um, okay. And then what, what I want to say, so I have L and uh, pi of L. Right. And then wh what I want to say is that the number of R rich points of pi of L is uh, at least as big as the number of R rich points of L. So each one of these points will project to an R rich point of pi of L. And uh, by being generic, those can also all be different points. So I still have all of the intersections that I had in R3, and maybe some more. OK. Um, 
so this three-dimensional question turns out to reduce to a two-dimensional question. And there's, we could try to fidget with it a little bit to produce an actual three-dimensional question. And Elikish and Sharir came up with a conjecture, a way of fidgeting with it, which came out of their work on the distinct distance problem, which we mentioned a little in the first lecture. Um, so, th so this is what they asked for, and, and it's now a theorem. So if we have L lines in R3, and to rule out the, these examples that come from planes, we insist that there are at most L to the 1 half in any plane. And now we get a kind of really three-dimensional problem. Um, and the conclusion is that there's a better estimate than, um, so for some range of R, which is interesting, um, the number of these is bounded by L to the 3 halves R to the minus 2. It's not super important uh, for my lecture what this is, but it's a stronger estimate than the semi trotter theorem. Um, and it is a sharp estimate in that range. OK. Um, so the, these two theorems are proven by some similar ideas. And I want to explain the, the main idea, how polynomials can contribute to the problem. Um, so I'm going to sketch the proof or a chunk of the proof of this theorem, the main new thing. Before I do that, let me say, what are the issues with trying to prove this theorem? Uh, OK, so there's this co-dimension issue that we've been talking about. It makes it hard to use the cutting method. Uh, there's the, another analogy is that for r equals 3, it's a lot like the joints problem. We only know one way so far to do the joints problem, which is with polynomials. So it suggests that polynomials should be relevant to have, uh, yeah, OK. And there's a, a third issue, though. The third issue is that this is false in finite fields. It's false in FQ3. That's the issue that we talked about at the beginning of the lecture. So let me remind you, it's like Samaretti Trotter. And um, it's not like the joints problem. So the, I didn't say this at the time, but the joints problem is also true in finite fields. And it's true with a very slight modification of the same proof. Um, so, so these things make it sound like we should use the polynomial method. But this thing makes it sound like there's some issue and that we're going to need to use something about the topology of R3 based on our experience with Samaretti Trotter. OK. So the plan is that somehow we want to use something like the cutting method and something like the polynomial method. And there's a surprisingly straightforward way of combining them, which is to cut things up with polynomials. So here's our plan. So the old plan was d red planes. And it would have looked sort of like this. And the new plan is that we will use a degree d algebraic surface. So instead, it will look sort of. OK, so I want to convince you that many of the features of this that we were using are still true in this generality. Um, so one important thing uh, is that each line enters at most d plus 1 cells, because it could only cross each plane once. But it's still true that the line can only intersect that surface d times, unless it lies entirely in the surface. So this is still true. Um, if we use d red planes, we got d cubed components, d cubed cells. And so and then um, Nets and I looked in topology books about what, you, what is the complement. And this is um, not always, but it can be d cubed components in a lot of examples. So that also matches up. Um, and now we gain something. What we gained is that there are lots more degree d surfaces than unions of planes. So we can quantify that by counting parameters, 
we have on the order of d parameters here, and we have on the order of d cubed parameters here. These parameters came up earlier in the talk when I was talking about whether we could realistically expect to equidistribute a bunch of points. So remember that I was saying before we have d cubed cells. And uh, for each cell, I'd like the same number of points. So that's kind of d cubed conditions I'm trying to engineer. I only had d parameters, so I better have a, have a reason why I hope I can do this. But the situation is much more optimistic looking for degree d algebraic surfaces. I have enough parameters to match the number of cells. And it's plausible uh, that, I could, that I could equidistribute. Um, that's not a proof. but. Uh, but I have enough parameters where I could hope to do that. And that's indeed true. And um, in order to prove that, that you can do that, it requires some results from topology, in particular the ones we talked about last time, the ham sandwich kind of things. Let me state what you can prove that way. So proposition, if S in R3 is a set of points and we're given some degree D, then there exists a polynomial of degree at most D so that each component of the complement has at most the sort of average number of points. Um, this is, right, so the idea of the proof is to use the ham sandwich theorem. The ham sandwich theorem says that if I have a bunch of sets of points, I can find a polynomial that bisects all of them. And we get this by using that repeatedly. I'll draw a picture. proof idea. Use the ham sandwich repeatedly. OK, so I start with a bunch of points. Um, first, I'd like to cut them in half. I can do that with a plane. I have two equal halves. Then I'd like to cut both of those in half. I can probably do that also with a plane. And I have four pieces of equal size. Now I'd like to cut all four of them in half. That I cannot do with a plane, but I can do it with a surface of controlled degree, and I know what the degree is from last time. Uh, and I keep doing that. OK. should also mention that there is fine print. So this is true as stated, but it's a sort of used car salesman version of the proposition. And uh, if your friend goes with you to the used car salesman, they would point out the following thing. Uh, some or all of the points of S may lie in Z of P. Right. So, so we have this surface in, the, in space, and each component of the complement has few points in it, just like we would like. But I didn't say anything about how many points are actually in the surface. They could all be in the surface. And they could all even be here. Or maybe they couldn't all be there. But uh, definitely, they could all be in the surface. Yeah? If you're willing to pay on the degree to remove the fine print? Uh, you have to pay a lot. Yeah. Um, so one way this could happen is if they were all in a plane. And remember that in a plane, a degree p polynomial only cuts it into d squared pieces. And so uh, in order to have this estimate, Almost all of the pieces, almost all of the points need to be, let's see. So as, as you pay in D, maybe you don't want to increase this. But if you think about the example of a plane, D needs to become quite big um, so that the number of planar domains is enough to have all of the points. That's a pathological. Yeah, that's right. So if you like, all of these are pathological cases of varying level of pathology. Um, and so you know, a plane is very pathological. Conic is 
quite pathological. Degree three is pretty pathological. At some point, we'll have to deal with them. We'll talk about it. Yeah. OK. Um, so, so now I can summarize the proof of the theorem. We, we pick some d. If you do some algebra, you figure out what is a good d to pick. Um, maybe I'll write it, but it's, it's not that important for you. Oh, I'll set the one half. Um, and then we cut the points. So S is going to be our set of R rich points. And we cut it up with this degree D surface. And the first case is that um, all of the points, or at least a good fraction of them, at least 1% of S, is in the complement. And if that happens, everything else is just like in the cutting method. We know how many points are in each cell. Um, we can know something about how many lines are in each cell. And then we apply more basic estimates in each cell, and we add it up. So imitate cutting. And everything is fine. And then there's a second case. The second case is the case that we were just talking about as being pathological, which we can call it that. But nevertheless, it happens. Um, the second case is that almost all of the points are in Z of P. Case two, 99% of the points are in ZFP. OK. I only have time to say a little bit about this case. Um, let's give those points a name. S prime is S intersected with ZFP. Um, if we do a computation, then we see that w one of two things will happen. One possibility is that the number of points is less than our bound. So we're happy, and we don't have to worry about anything else. The other possibility is that there's quite a lot of points, and they're in this, almost all in this surface of a rather low degree. And um, so in other words, an, another possibility is that the degree of the surface is surprisingly small for the number of points. More precisely, um, the degree of S prime be less than 1 over 1,000 times S prime to the 1 third. Remember from the first lecture that for a generic set S prime, the degree of S prime would be close to S prime to the 1 third, or a little bit above that. So the conclusion is that the, the degree of these points is much less than happens generically, and there's some algebraic structure. This is what I suggested. This is what I decided to define as algebraic structure in the first lecture. Um, so we didn't prove the theorem yet, but I can summarize what we did. We didn't use the assumption yet. That's a good point. Uh, I also erased it. OK, but I was pointing out the assumption in the theorem was that we have L lines, and there are not too many in a plane. And I haven't mentioned at all this condition that there are not too many in a plane. Um, and in case one, we don't need it. Uh, this actually works as, as described. And somewhere in case two, we would have to use that there are not too many in a plane. Um, so case two breaks into some pieces, depending on whether this Z of P has some planes. And the planes are dealt with one way, because there's not too many lines in a plane. And the pieces that aren't planes, which get dealt with in some other way. OK, which unfortunately I won't have time to tell you. I'll summarize what I did tell you. Um, but what I did tell you is that if there is a counterexample to this theorem, then it has some algebraic structure. That might be a little disappointing. It's not as good as just proving the theorem. But um, th the reason it happens is that there are a lot of questions like this. And sometimes there's a counterexample with some algebraic structure. And sometimes there isn't. And, and in this case, the only counterexample, if you want to call it that, is when they're all in plane, which is some very strong algebraic structure. In other problems, there might be a higher degree algebraic surface. So because that's the situation, it's reasonable to try to prove first that if there's a counterexample, it has some algebraic structure. And then after that, you can look at the possible algebraic structures and see if there's one that has, has this kind of configuration or if there's, if there's not. OK. Um, there are a few things like this that I would have loved to talk about, but a speaker has to figure out how to use their time. Um, 
So I'll, I'll mention that there is a survey on my web page, which mostly follows these lectures, but it has a few other things in it. And it explains things like, uh, how do we use the assumption in the theory? To conclude, I just want to conclude by summarizing what we've been talking about for the three lectures for a minute. Um, so we've been studying combinatorial structures, arrangements of lines and other things where there's a lot of combinatorial structure. And the main point is that these all have algebraic or polynomial structures. All of these situations with some lots of incidences or something have algebraic structure and that then we can use to study it and polynomials become involved. And we really have two different mechanisms that we talked about, which are the heart of the heart of the polynomial method, I think. The first mechanism was in lecture one. We used parameter counting and the vanishing lemma to do this. And it came out of the finite field nicodem. The arguments came from there. And, and that, in turn, came out of error correcting codes. Right. And today, we had a, a, different, a different mechanism, a different method, which used the idea of cuttings. And it used the ham sandwich theorem. And uh, these cuttings, they came from incidence geometry. And the ham sandwich theorem, it came from differential geometry. Uh, anyway, and, but and all of these things have some kind of common point of view or philosophy about the relationship between combinatorics and algebra, which is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you all for Thank coming. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's right. So on my webpage, there's a survey article. At the bottom, there's something called expository writing. And there's a survey article, and it has lots of references. Yeah? Um, yeah, so it's, it's related. There's a transformation of the plane that turns lines into unit parabolas. It's um, x, y goes to x, y plus x squared. I think. And so you take the old counterexample and you do this. Yeah, I agree. That's a natural question. I don't know of any work on it. Yeah. So the question was, if you have some, say, two planes in R4, you could talk about the number of lines that lie in a lot of two planes. That's a good idea. Yeah? What's the problem that uh, you would most like to solve that this technique did not? Ah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, well, the problem I would most like to solve with it is the Kakea problem. Um, that's what got me excited about going into it, or the, the Nikodim problem, is close relative. We talked about the first time. And all it is is that instead of lines, replace all the lines in anything I said with thin cylinders and ask, are things still true or do they break down? And it's hard to do the polynomials on the thin cylinders because you know, a polynomial is not going to identically vanish on a thin cylinder. So you have to say something else. So maybe it vanishes at many points in a thin cylinder. And what does that tell you if it vanishes at many, many points in this thin cylinder? And you look at it over here, it's quite complicated what that, or it's either quite complicated or, or, or nothing, <laughs> what it says over there. Yeah, so that's been a big um, non-success of the polynomial method. Yeah, that's a good. So the question was, what if we look in hyperbolic space or on the sphere or in, in 
different spaces where there are some natural curves? Those are great questions, and they haven't been investigated that much. Well, we've got a couple of scholars that did this work. Uh, yeah, why don't you say? Well, there is an analog of the thermal ice water uh, results of uh, bound on space. Ah. You can replace what way you can tell. Okay. You are standing there. <laughs> <laughs> so Avi says that there's a paper by Bergan and Katz and Tao where they study some ready trotter in finite fields. That was the thing that you might remember I just told you was false. Right? Um, but uh, it was false if you looked at all of the lines. And you could ask, suppose I only look at a small fraction of the lines. Um, then is it true or are there some bounds? And there are some, it's not totally understood, but there are some non-trivial bounds in that situation. But th that question has a different flavor. There are lots of natural families of curves, and, and really we don't know that much. Yeah. Um, I don't know any connection with that. You know, another cool thing you can ask about lines in R3 is that their, so their complement will have some interesting, say, fundamental group. And, and so there's a lot of questions you can ask, but I don't know anything about it. Any other questions? Okay, so that is not the case. So let's uh, thank the speaker for this wonderful